joint work with uh, Dennis Elbrechter, who is a PhD student of uh, Philip Grosses uh, and Philip, Gita Kotinyuk, uh, Philip Peterson, and my student Dimitri Berkristenko, who also uh, helped me with the slides. So what I would like to do today is I would like to talk about deep learning, and obviously there are many elements in deep learning, and uh, this talk is really about counting. It's counting bits, so most of the results are counting arguments. Um, what I would like to do is I would like to isolate the uh, learning part, the learning algorithm. I would like to isolate uh, the aspect of uh, access to data, so I'm going to assume that we have the best possible learning algorithm out there. Uh, I'm not going to specify it, I don't know what it is. I'm going to assume that we have access to infinite amounts of data, and uh, what I would like to focus on is uh, how well can we in principle learn with deep neural networks. You will see later what I mean specifically by uh, how well. So before we get started, so let me briefly review some of the uh, big successes uh, of deep neural networks. So one is in classification. So you didn't think that you could just sit here and listen to me talking. I'm going to make you work a little bit. So can you help me um, classify those images? Who do you recognize? Well, for the I would guess yes, very good. Karyan Garancha? No. Von Neumann, yes. And Kurt Gödel, yes. All right, good. Okay. Um, image annotation is another success. Can you help me annotate this image? That is going to be, most of it is easy for Charlie, but the last one is specially for him. Um, so, what uh, do you think this picture describes? Sorry? A conductor. Yes, which conductor? Charlie? Klaus Kleiber, yes. Yes, yes, very good. Conducting which orchestra? Well, the Vienna Philharmonics. New Year's concert, and now this is the one for Charlie. How often did he conduct it? Uh, right, and which one is this? You can tell from the picture. <laughs> He's very good, but you know I knew this, so I had to. Uh... <laughs> well, let's see. He, he has to answer the year, and you can tell it. Um, you can uniquely identify the year from the picture, and Charlie would know why. No, but you, you know what in the picture it is that helps you to identify the year. The flowers, the flower bouquet. Are you giving up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but then you can guess at least. Uh, oh, it's 89. Okay. And uh, poor Carlos Kleiber, he was a very, very shy person. He didn't conduct very much, as you know, those of you who know him know. And then uh, when he conducted the second one, he said uh, he actually filled in for Lenny Bernstein, who had passed away uh, shortly before. And then he said after the second one, two is enough because I cannot smile for two hours. And also, he couldn't take the audience's clapping in the Radetzky march. So they had to convince him to allow that. He was very unhappy about that. But he said, no, you cannot. Viennese audiences want to clap during the Radetzky march. So he uh, accepted that. Good. OK, by the way, this is not in that reference. I completely made this up. That reference has something else that was not aesthetically pleasing. So I replaced it. So this is good. All right, so let's get uh, to serious uh, things. So a deep neural network is essentially a composition of affine mappings and nonlinearities, often depicted in terms of nodes. So you have input nodes, input variables, then you have hidden layers in blue and an output layer. The mathematical definition is uh, that of um, affine mappings W and um, pointwise or elementwise nonlinearities rho. So we want to write functions phi of x as such a concatenation of w's and rows. Uh, we are going to uh, be interested in m, the total number of non-zero parameters uh, in those matrices al and in the biases or vectors bl. We are going to be interested in the number of layers l, so that's uh, here the number of affine transformations. And we are going to be interested in the width of the network, which is simply 
uh, the maximum over the number of nodes across the network. Okay, so remember depth, width, and total number of non-zero parameters. We're going to measure at some point the complexity of this network uh, as the complexity needed to describe the locations of the non-zero weights and the number of non-zero weights. So that's why M is a recurring parameter. It's going to be important. All right, so as I already said in the beginning, what uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that we have the best possible learning algorithm available and we have uh, access to all the data we wish, so we know the function uh, f of x. Uh, it's a little bit like in information theory when uh, uh, the channel capacity was first computed, what Shannon said was there exists a code, I don't know what it is, but there exists and let's see how far we can go in terms of uh, achievable rates. Um, so th those are the two elements I'm isolating, and uh, I'm going to ask how well we can represent uh, a given function phi of x uh, uh, in terms of such a concatenation. Now, I have to tell you what I mean by how well. Well, before we do that, let's review some classical results. So the, uh, the result that uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with is the so-called universal approximation theorem that goes back to Sibenko, uh, Hornick, uh, and uh, also 10 years later, uh, Pinkos Kurt Hornig is a professor here at uh, the Wirtschaftsuniversität in Vienna, um, essentially saying that uh, you can approximate uh, uh, any function, uh, any decent function with uh, um, a single hidden layer neural network. So you have an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. Uh, this result does not give you a bound on the width of the network. And then there is a theorem more recent by Lou et al. that says any function mapping Rn to R can be approximated by a neural network with um, a nonlinearity that is a rectified linear unit. So we saw this yesterday. Uh, this is the function that is zero for negative arguments and then just uh, x for positive arguments of width n plus 4, and there is no bound on depth. And you will see later why I made a point of saying there is no bound on width and no bound of depth here. It doesn't, the result doesn't allow you to say anything about the network complexity. It says it's possible, but it doesn't tell you uh, what you have to pay for it. Now, what I would like to do is, uh, rather than discussing the individual contributions in those papers, I would just like to give you a brief uh, uh, review of uh, most of the, um, uh, you know, the most known results uh, uh, in this field, and of course, uh, necessarily, this is highly incomplete. Uh, th there's many more references, but uh, the, the field is so large, so just some representative ones. Um, after the 89 work by Sibenko and Hornick, uh, there was um, a very influential paper by Baron um, giving error bounds uh, for smooth functions in terms of the number of neurons. So um, the complexity of the network was the number of uh, neurons used in the hidden layer. So this was for a single hidden layer neural network. Then uh, there were results on approximation rates by DeVore, uh, optimal approximation of smooth functions by Mashkar and Michele, and uh, uh, localized approximation results by Chui and others. And uh, I don't have to read all this to you. What I would like to point out is that uh, this is the first paper, as far as I know, that uh, makes a point of deep networks giving an advantage uh, over shallow networks. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to have uh, some results uh, that hopefully will convince you that there is a case for having deep networks rather than shallow networks. And uh, then there is some recent work by Eldon and Shamir that also makes the observation that deep networks can do certain things that shallow networks cannot do. And this continues. Uh, there's work by Cohen and others, uh, again, making a case for deep networks. I'd also like to point out uh, results by Jensen, Schwab, Gross, and others um, on deep neural network approximation of the solutions of certain PDEs. And uh, the final paper I would like to mention, this is the paper actually that got us started on this whole thing, is a paper by Shaham Kloninger and Koifman that relates uh, M-term approximation rates to so-called M-edge approximation rates in neural networks. So that's the paper literally that I uh, had the preprint on archive and I visited Philip uh, in Vienna and I told him this is very good stuff, we have to do something with this. So I would like to encourage you to have a look at that paper. Uh, it has some very nice ideas. Good. All right. Uh, so there is uh, two parts to my talk. In the first part, I would like to talk about the approximation of individual functions. And uh, we are going to ask ourselves uh, which functions can we approximate uh, with deep neural networks? Well, obviously, uh, everything that is uh, decent, as we know from Sibenko and Hornig. But we're also going to ask ourselves how complex are these networks going to be. So we're going to measure the complexity. And um, the main result, 
the first part of the talk is going to be the following statement. Deep networks provide exponential approximation accuracy for a wide range of functions. Exponential means the approximation error decays exponentially in the number of non-zero parameters in M, connectivity of the network, okay? Uh, including functions uh, that so far um, have not, um, or, or the, the best possible results were polynomial approximation rates, like the Weierstrass function uh, and uh, oscillatory textures, and more on that uh, later. So the way it goes is, uh, yeah, and the second part of the talk, we're going to look at function classes, uh, typically unit balls in Bezos spaces, modulation spaces, smooth functions, and so on. And there, the complexity of the network uh, is going to be measured uh, differently. We're going to measure the complexity of the network in terms of the number of bits needed uh, to uh, describe the topology of the network in terms of where are the non-zero weights located. And we're going to quantize uh, the weights in the network. We're not going to allow them to be real numbers, so we want to be more practical. And we're going to view the network as an encoder of the function, and uh, you need a certain number of bits to describe uh, the topology and the quantized weights. And we're going to ask how many bits and uh, is there a fundamental limit, and how uh, well can we approach that fundamental limit? And the main statement here is going to be that deep neural networks can learn optimally vastly different uh, function classes. So this, these are the two main takeaways uh, of this talk. So now I, let's go into more details, and I'm going to start with approximation of individual functions. There is a paper uh, by Dmitry Yarotsky. Uh, that showed how to uh, implement a squaring function with deep neural networks. And uh, so we based on that result, uh, had some extensions, more on that on the next slide. And uh, what um, this result here shows is that uh, you can approximate the squaring function over the unit interval, of course you can extend this, with an error of no more than epsilon, with a network of a width that is equal to four. This b here is um, the, the size of the coefficients, the magnitude. So this is going to be important later on because uh, this is needed uh, a bound on the gross rate of those coefficients in order to get rate distortion optimality. And uh, the depth of the network scales like log 1 over epsilon. So the total number of non-zero parameters uh, scales like log 1 over epsilon because the width is 4 and width times depth is an upper bound to the total number of parameters. So I'm going to come back to that uh, in a second, but let me just uh, summarize relative to Yarotsky's result. Uh, is another beautiful paper that I encourage you uh, to read. Um, it, this result needs no skip connections. The width is specified explicitly. It's for arbitrary domains. All these are uh, simple things. The weights of the network that we get scale no faster than polynomial in the size of the domain. And this is really crucial for rate distortion optimality. And you will see later what I mean by rate distortion optimality. And uh, in the approximation of polynomials, in contrast to the original paper by Yarotsky, the width of our network does not scale in the degree of the polynomial. Again, this is going to be crucial to approximate sinusoidal functions and to get rate distortion optimality for modulation spaces, which is one of the key results that we have. So the last two are key to get the optimality results that we want. So what I said before was that uh, this network has finite width and the depth scales uh, I said polylogarithmically, actually like log 1 over epsilon. Now, since the total number of non-zero parameters is upper bounded by the depths times the width squared for the matrices in the FN transformations, plus uh, the width for the um, uh, offset, the bias part, the vector B, um, you see here that if uh, L scales like log 1 over epsilon, W is uh, 4 in that case. We have constant times log 1 over epsilon. If you rewrite that, you see that epsilon uh, decays exponentially in the number of uh, parameters. I put here 1 over P because if L is not log 1 over epsilon, but log 1 over epsilon raised to the P's power, then you get this 1 over P here. So this is exponential approximation accuracy. Uh, in summary, finite width of the network combined with polylogarithmic depths yields exponential error decay in connectivity. And uh, based on this, uh, the squaring result, you can now develop a whole, I call it, optimal neural network algebra. So you can build the multiplication operation out of the squaring result simply by writing the multiplication x times y uh, in this form here. So you have a linear combination uh, of squaring operations and the linear combination x plus y is just an affine transformation on the input vector x and y. And that's how you get uh, a multiplication network. And the important aspect here is that you retain optimality in terms of exponential 
uh, error decay. In other words, uh, the total number of parameters remains uh, or uh, scales like uh, polar logarithmic in 1 over epsilon in, in everything that follows now. So once you have uh, multiplication, you have squaring, you have multiplication, then you can build uh, powers of x, x to the k. Um, so combination of squaring multiplication, again, you retain exponential error decay. Then you can uh, approximate smooth functions. Uh, there's a result in Chebyshev interpolation theory that is used to get um, a relation between smooth functions and polynomial approximation networks. I'm going to define later what I mean by smooth functions, essentially. The nth derivative uh, is bounded norm by uh, n factorial. Uh, and finally, sinusoidal functions. This is a bit more tricky. There you have to exploit uh, the periodicity. And there is, if you're interested in the technical details, you're encouraged to look at the paper. There is something about the rectified linear unit um, the, that uh, if you have a, a relo, so zero and then linear, you can build a head function out of the rectified linear unit through linear combinations of shifted versions thereof. Now, what happens if you self-compose a head function? Uh, so head function composed with a head function, you get a double head function. You compose it again with a head function, you get a quadruple head function, and so on. And so this is actually, uh, by the way, the, um, all the results here are for rectified linear units. Uh, almost all of them go through for sigmoidal functions, but there's one thing about sinusoidal approximation that we are not entirely sure that it goes through. Okay, so I'm going to talk only about RELO. But this composition property that you get uh, spline-like functions or piecewise linear functions, this is actually the, uh, the engine uh, in uh, all our results that I'm presenting here. But uh, again, as I said, you can extend it uh, to sigmoidal function, but you need partly different techniques. Okay, good, so that's for individual function approximation. Now, once you have that, we can switch gears and look at uh, function classes. So we... Uh, going to look at the approximation uh, of, let's say, a unit ball in Bezos space. And uh, we're going to consider networks now with quantized weights. And as already said before, the network complexity is going to be measured in terms of the number of bits needed uh, to locate the non-zero parameters in the network and uh, to store their quantized versions. So from now on, when I say neural network, just think about a bit string. So this bit string encodes the topology and uh, the quantized weights in the network. And we're going to be interested, in terms of complexity measures, in how long does this bit string have to be so as, uh, the net so as for the network to uh, uh, approximate every function in the function class C that we consider with uh, an error no more than epsilon. Okay, so the worst case error is going to be uh, epsilon. So that's uh, the optimality measure. Uh, the theory that we're going to use uh, it goes back to Kolmogorov. Then uh, Donohoe picked this up in uh, 91, uh, 93, and 96 uh, follow up papers. And uh, I learned this theory from a beautiful paper by Cohen, Damen, Dobshi, uh, and Devor. So thank you very much. Uh, this was uh, how I got into this. Um, the, the basic idea is the following you have uh, a set of encoders and decoders. The encoders map your uh, function class onto a bit string of length L, and the decoders demap, so they take as input a bit string of length L, and they map back onto a function class. And then you want to see what the error is. Uh, in other words, what in particular what you're interested in is what is the minimum length that you need for these bit strings, so that there exists an encoder-decoder pair, such that your overall reconstruction error is no more than epsilon, and you're going to look at the soup uh, in your function class. Okay, so the worst case error is allowed to be um, uh, at most epsilon, and you want to know how long that bit string should be. So for those of you, uh, or most of you, I guess, you already understand that there's covering number arguments and so on, Kolmogorov, Tikomirov, uh, epsilon entropy, etc. cetera. Um, what uh, we are going to look at is what we call the optimal exponent, which is the maximum, or the soup, over gamma, such that this uh, minimax code lengths uh, is in O epsilon to the minus 1 over gamma. Uh, so gamma star is this optimal exponent. It quantifies the description complexity of the function class. Larger gamma star means smaller growth rate, hence better. Okay, so we're looking for the largest uh, gamma here. And smaller growth rate means shorter bit strings, means smaller memory requirements for storing the signals in the function class. So we want to know and, and now you see already what our framework is going to be. We want to know fundamentally, given the function class, how long uh, or what is the scaling, uh, what is the, uh, the optimal exponent. 
And then we're going to ask ourselves, well, once we know that optimal exponent, uh, can neural networks achieve that optimal exponent? If yes, for which function classes can they? And we know from nonlinear approximation theory that you have Bezos spaces and wavelets, modulation spaces and Wilson bases. So those are optimal pairs in the sense that the dictionary-based approximation of functions in Bezos spaces with wavelets give you the optimal exponent. For modulation spaces, it's local cosine bases. And the question is, what is it for uh, deep neural networks? Yes. Just a quick question. Are you thinking also about high dimensions? No. No. So, no. Right. Sure. Right? Yeah. Out of the picture, it's scalar. Good. All right. Good. So, okay. Kolmogorov Tikomir of Epsilon Entropy. You have a compact. Uh, you cover it uh, with uh, balls of radius Epsilon. Uh, you look at the minimum possible cardinality of uh, such an Epsilon net. You take the logarithm thereof. So this is the Kolmogorov Tikomir of Epsilon Entropy. And uh, the basic idea is the following. If you encode the ball centers, how many bits do you need? Well, if you have n balls, you need log n bits, okay? So log n bits allow you to encode the ball centers, and then uh, if you approximate every function within a ball around that corresponding ball center, you get an error of no more than epsilon, because epsilon is the ball radius. So that's what it is. And then it's known that, uh, well, of course, if the set is not finite, then uh, h goes to infinity as epsilon becomes smaller. And in most, actually, many interesting cases, uh, H scales like epsilon to the one minus uh, alpha, to the minus one over alpha, or there's a log factor here. And we are going to uh, look at this, you know, rougher measure. We are just going to look uh, at this exponent here. So I'm going to later introduce an uh, O tilde notation, and O tilde means up to factors here uh, that uh, actually grow slower uh, than this factor here. So that's our measure. It's a crude measure of growth. And... Uh, uh, with that uh, measure at hand, we can now proceed to uh, dictionary approximation. So as I already said, in dictionary approximation, what we're interested in is given a function class, given a dictionary D, you want to find the best M term approximation. M is the number of uh, participating dictionary elements in the approximation. And uh, you want to get the error to scale like M to the minus gamma. So epsilon is M to the minus gamma. Uh, or m is epsilon to the uh, minus 1 over gamma, so that's uh, our exponent. Hmm? So we relate m uh, to epsilon via m to the epsilon minus 1 over gamma. And uh, this is referred to as the best m-term approximation. The question is, what are optimal pairs of dictionaries that give you this best m-term approximation? Before we can do that, uh, we have to, however, ask ourselves uh, a few tough questions that, fortunately, David Donahoe already asked, namely, um, well, if gamma star of C and D, so the optimal exponent we get here, so C is the function class, D is a dictionary, uh, it quantifies how well the function class C can be approximated in the dictionary D, and larger gamma means better approximation. For a given C, is there a fundamental limit on gamma star of C and D when we can vary over D? And the answer is, uh, well, every dense and countable D results in gamma uh, star equal to infinity, so this is not uh, terribly useful. However, uh, if you allow such a dictionary, the total number of bits that you need to represent the participating elements uh, is infinity because, you, first of all, you have to search an infinite set, and secondly, you have to uh, use infinitely many bits to store the corresponding indices of the participating dictionary elements. So that's not uh, very useful. So what uh, David Donohoe introduced is this concept of effective best M-term approximation. So what he said is, is that, well, I'm going to allow you, if you want an M-term approximation, to search polynomially deep in M into the network. Okay, so you can search the first pi of M, where pi is a polynomial, dictionary elements, and no further than that. And in addition to that, uh, you are to uh, have bounded coefficients uh, in the M-term representation so that you can quantize them. And uh, the way you quantize them is you do it uniformly, and then there is a certain number of bits you need, and you have to control the uh, approximation error that um, originates from the quantization of the coefficients. And uh, the way this is done is you do a Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization, and then if you have a control 
uh, if you have controlled um, coefficient errors, then you get control of the error on, on FM. And I'm outlining this because it's going to be important in deep neural networks where we have nonlinearities. There, this is a little bit more difficult. Uh, in, in the dictionary case, it's relatively simple. Okay, so what Donahoe then showed uh, is or defined this concept of effective best M term approximation rates, same as before. The only difference is that you are allowed to search polynomially deep into the network and you are to have um, bounded coefficients. So the corresponding uh, exponent that he gets is called gamma star effective for effective approximation. And uh, remember before, uh, gamma star of C uh, can be infinity if you allow uh, a dense dictionary. Gamma star effective of C comma D is upper bounded by gamma star of C. So operationally, this is a quantity that tells us that, uh, well, this is the, the best possible, and uh, depending on how close we get to that gamma, uh, we can say that D is a good dictionary or a bad dictionary for C. So obviously, if uh, D uh, gives you gamma star effective C comma D is equal to gamma star of C, then you say that the function class is optimally represented by your dictionary D. So it's this kind of optimality that we're going to be interested in. And uh, let's do a back of the envelope calculation uh, to see why this combination of polynomial depth search and bounded coefficients gives us optimality. This is going to be important because we're going to take this back of the envelope calculation later to deep neural networks and we're going to build uh, a similar theory for deep neural networks where we uh, move from M-term approximation to M-edge or M-weight approximation. So I'm going to refer back to this later. So if we have... Um, Search, if you search polynomial deep into the network, then how many bits do we need to represent the indices of the participating dictionary elements? Well, log of pi of m, which is uh, constant times log m. We have m participating dictionary elements, so we have uh, order m log m bits to represent the indices of the participating dictionary elements. Then the coefficients are bounded. We quantize them by rounding to integer multiples of m to the minus some uh, alpha. And then the total number of quantization levels is m divided to m to the minus alpha. So it's m to some exponent. And uh, the total number of bits needed to represent each of the quantized coefficients is log of the number of quantization levels, which gives us again m times log m because we have m coefficients. So m log m for the locations uh, and of the participating uh, dictionary elements, the indices, and m log m to represent the quantized coefficients. And as I said, you can actually show that uh, uh, this quantization is enough to uh, give you um, a uh, corresponding approximation error that uh, you, know, you can control. All right, so and then you can show that there is an encoder-decoder pair that reconstructs f from order m log m bits with epsilon uh, scaling uh, like uh, this here. So that's, it's actually not difficult, it's a bit tedious. And uh, if you have an optimal dictionary D, you have gamma star effective is equal to gamma star of C, and the resulting code length overall is m log m bits, participating um, dictionary elements indices, plus quantized coefficients, and now m is uh, epsilon to the minus one over gamma star effective, which is equal to gamma star of C. So it's this here, and this I call O tilde. Obviously this is not O because the log, uh, uh, you need to make the exponent a bit smaller to take care of the log. So this is what I mean by O tilde. Uh, it's this whatever is an argument up to factors that grow slower. Okay, so that's how you get in a nutshell optimality. I mean, the proof, as I said, uh, is this is the main idea of the proof and then there's lots of tedious elements. All right, so here is a summary of uh, function classes and uh, optimal dictionaries that we uh, know of. Uh, so Sobolev spaces, where you have corresponding optimal dictionaries that are Fourier, Fourier series, uh, or wavelets. Now, uh, these square brackets here means uh, actually that uh, wavelets here for uh, LP Sobolev is uh, P between one and two. Uh, wavelets are optimal, Fourier are strictly suboptimal, and the corresponding exponent is whatever is in square brackets here, namely this expression here. So just to show you that there are actually uh, indeed suboptimal dictionaries. And then you can go through the list. You have Bezov spaces, wavelet, uh, Fourier are strictly suboptimal for Bezov spaces, modulation spaces, uh, you have Wilson bases uh, as uh, optimal uh, dictionaries. Okay, so 
Now, when you are to approximate a function class, uh, how do you do it in um, dictionary approximation? Well, you need to know something about the structure of the function class. When I say structure, is it in a base of space, modulation space, whatever is a good model. I'm not talking about modeling, but you need to know this. Then you choose the optimal dictionary, and then you're guaranteed to get the optimal approximation. Uh, if you like, uh, if there is one sentence I would like you to take away from this talk is, it's the following. What we are going to show in the rest of the talk is that deep neural networks give you optimality universally with this one structure, deep neural networks, for all these function classes, okay? So you don't have to go and pick if it's base of its wavelets, modulation, it's Wilson, and so on. You just take this one structure, deploy it, learn. If you have the best possible learning algorithm, it's going to find the optimal representation of the elements in your function class universally. It doesn't matter whether it's an affine structure, whether it's a well Heisenberg structure, or whatever it is. So all these uh, optimality results you can get with a deep neural network. Okay? Of course, you need a learning algorithm, you need the data, and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about that. Okay, good. So here is our framework for um, function classes. We're going to use the uh, kolmogorov donohoe framework, encoding the network topology and quantized weights, and we need to control the quantization induced error. So uh, um, the basic idea, and this is what was uh, kind of quite uh, implicit, but it was there in Shaham, Cloninger, and Kaufman. Uh, they said, well, we have M-term approximations. Let's think about M-edge approximations. So that's where we got the idea from. And uh, so now you replace the number of participating terms by the number of weights in the network, and you're going to ask yourself again for an error decay of m to the minus gamma, where m is uh, the number of non-zero edges, uh, and a plus bias is also in the network, so number of non-zero parameters in the network. So the uh, number of uh, dictionary elements that participate is replaced by the number of non-zero edges uh, and uh, bias uh, terms. It's an unfortunate name, but that's what it's called in deep learning. And uh, we're going to find, we look at all possible networks, all possible topologies, and we're going to be interested in the best m weight approximation rate. And the first question we want to answer is, if you give me an approximation error epsilon and a given function class, how complex does the network have to be uh, so that we can, in fact, uh, get an approximation of error no more than epsilon? So we heard yesterday that overparameterization is uh, what you should use in practice. This question here is, uh, how complex does the network at least have to be so that we're guaranteed uh, to be able, in principle, to find an approximation of error no more than epsilon. And actually, there's even a strong converse that we can show that uh, if you don't make the network connectivity grow uh, at the minimum rate in epsilon, uh, then you can show that uh, there is no way that you can get the approximation error. So there's an achievability result and the corresponding converse, and they match. Uh, and that gives you the fundamental bound. And again, in practice, uh, of course, you will overparameterize. That's what uh, practitioners do. All right, so remember the back of the envelope calculation. So we said uh, that uh, for dictionaries, we had the polynomial depth search constraint. This is not needed uh, in deep neural networks. Why? Because of the tree like structure of the network. Uh, what do I mean by this? Well, what I mean by this is the following. The total number of weights in the network is upper bounded by the depth times the width times the width plus one. So if the network connectivity uh, is M, then uh, L and W can, of course, not grow faster uh, than M. I mean, you could take a network of width one and then just you know, have depths M, or you can have uh, a single hidden layer network and uh, have M uh, hidden nodes, okay? So you can... Um, uh, deduce that uh, this quantity here scales like m cubed. So you have m cubed possibilities for the locations of your no m non-zero weights. Now you have m non-zero weights. How many bits do you need to store the locations of your on m non-zero weights in your network? Well, it's log of uh, m cubed choose m, which is order m log m. Okay? So no polynomial depth search constraint needed here. It's given to you by the tree structure. Uh, of course, that assumes that the network layout, the depths, and the number of nodes in each layer can be encoded uh, with m log m bits that you can show. It's, again, uh, not difficult but uh, tedious. And now the question is, what is the growth rate in terms of epsilon or m that uh, we assume for the depths of the network? Because in principle, you see this here. I mean, if this is m cubed, I mean, we can uh, have the growth rate of the depths be uh, you know, within, of course, uh, these limits here. Uh, something, so we uh, 
assume that uh, the, the depth scales like log 1 over epsilon or polylog 1 over epsilon, uh, inspired by the approximation results we had in the first part of the talk about individual function approximation. And uh, we're going to be interested in approximation are decaying as m to the minus gamma. So therefore, epsilon is proportional to the m to the minus gamma, and therefore, the depth is going to grow polylogarithmically in m. So we're going to look at networks with uh, depths growing polylogarithmically in m. And uh, we are going to uh, ask ourselves, um, what is the number of bits needed uh, for deep neural networks to represent functions from a given function class, and how does it relate to what you can fundamentally do with nonlinear dictionary approximation? Uh, the final part uh, in extending or transferring uh, the komogorov donohoe theory to deep neural networks is quantization of the weights uh, in the network. So since you have no linearities, uh, you need to work a little bit harder, but essentially it's uh, Lipschitz uh, bounds and so on. And it's, again, it's tedious, uh, but not uh, overly difficult. So we are going in summary to look at the concept of best M weight approximation subject to polylogarithmic depths in M gross and polynomial weight gross. Um, this is uh, our effective best m weight approximation rate. So within the class of networks that have, uh, uh, that satisfy what I just said, um, we are going to find the optimal network and we want the corresponding approximation error to decay like m to the minus gamma and the corresponding best coefficient, sorry, uh, exponent is going to be gamma neural network effective. And the rest of the talk is all going to be about uh, for which function classes is gamma neural network effective going to be equal to the fundamental gamma star of C. You can already guess uh, in wavelets, if you can approximate the mother wavelet well, the remaining wavelets are obtained by scalings and shifts. Now a shift, well, AX plus B is very easy. Uh, scaling, you have an affine transformation that should actually go through. So it's not going to be so surprising that deep neural networks do well or actually optimally in whatever, with whatever function class that wavelets approximate optimally. What is more surprising is that they also do well with anything else, including while Heisenberg structures, okay? Okay, good. So we are going to say that the function class is optimally represented by a neural network if gamma neural network effective star effective of C is equal to gamma star of C. And actually you can show again that um, your gamma neural network star effective is upper bounded by the fundamental gamma star of C. There is an encoder decoder argument that you need to make again tedious, uh, but uh, not overly difficult. Okay, good. Now, uh, I told you that uh, we would look for uh, the minimum growth rate in terms of the connectivity uh, for the network to allow in principle approximation with a soup uh, error here of no more than epsilon. So in particular, what you can show is that uh, if your gamma is greater than gamma star of C, remember, bigger gamma is better because you have smaller growth rate, fewer bits to store. Uh, if your gamma is greater than gamma star of C, the soup of uh, the connectivity cannot be in O epsilon to the minus 1 over gamma. Um, in particular, what you can show is that uh, if uh, you exceed uh, this gamma star of C, uh, then you get the error here to be greater or equal, so you violate uh, this condition, uh, for infinitely many m. So that's the strong converse. In other words, what we showed here is that um, gamma star of C is the maximum gamma you can have so as to get uh, you know, this uh, approximation error condition satisfied. And if you do exceed that gamma, uh, there's no way you can uh, satisfy it. So that's what I call a strong converse uh, to the achievability result. Okay, so the question, as I said before, is going to be for which classes uh, of C, for which function classes do neural networks give you optimal approximation? Okay. And all that with quantized coefficients uh, and so on and so forth. All right. Uh, now, the, uh, the way we do it, I have 10 more, five? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so, just in short, the way we attack this problem is the following. So, how do you answer this question now of for which function classes are deep neural network optimal in terms of uh, this Komogorov Donohoe framework? Well, what we did is because we knew uh, optimality for dictionary approximation, 
we try to develop a theory that transfers optimality results from dictionary approximation to neural network approximation. In other words, what we try to find is a theory that tells you the following. If you have uh, an optimal pair of function class and dictionary, um, is there a way uh, to optimally represent the dictionary elements with neural networks? Uh, and then you could potentially conclude that neural networks could learn this uh, optimal dictionary elements, and that would give us optimality for neural networks. Uh, it's, well, you hold on to something. If you try to get somewhere and you have no clue where to go, you hold on to whatever you know, and that's uh, what we did. In particular, uh, we call this the transference principle. What we did is we said, if we have an optimal m-term approximation for a function class, we're going to try to build uh, deep neural networks for the participating dictionary elements with the connectivity scaling like O tilde of M. So O tilde is like say M times log M or M poly log M and so on. So that the neural network scales not significantly faster in terms of its connectivity uh, than uh, the connectivity, uh, sorry, than uh, the, uh, the number of terms um, scales that you will need in dictionary approximation. So M in dictionary approximations, number of participating elements. For us, it's number of non-zero edge and bias uh, weights. And uh, that's a transference principle. And uh, again, I'm not going to explain all the details, but that's what we use. And uh, that works out. And it gives you the following optimality results. Uh, so first, for wavelets. Uh, the first result is that uh, any function class that is uh, optimally represented by, we call this affine dictionaries, and this includes wavelets, ridgelets, curvelets, shearlets, alpha shearlets. So anything that you can optimally represent by these dictionaries is optimally representable by ReLU neural networks. And uh, the way this is done, and it's always the same argument, is the following. So what we show is uh, that if D is such an affine dictionary, the list of dictionaries I just gave you, then the gamma for neural network uh, star effective of C is at least as large as the one you get for dictionary approximation. In other words, using a neural network to represent uh, this function is not going to uh, give you a penalty. Okay? So neural network is at least as good. All right? Then um, we know that uh, neural network gamma is upper bounded by the fundamental gamma. So we have the fundamental gamma greater or equal than neural network gamma greater or equal than the nonlinear dictionary approximation gamma. And if the dictionary is optimal for your function class, then this gamma star effective is equal to gamma star of C. So you have sandwiched your gamma neural network between this upper bound and the matching lower bound, and you are done. You have established optimality. It's always the same show. Uh, and that, that we keep using all the way through the end. And so for uh, modulation spaces, Gabor, um, uh, and Wilson basis, we do exactly the same thing. And, and here, it's a bit more tricky, because as I said before, for wavelets, you have affine transformations, so shifts and scalings. Uh, in Gabor theory, you have these modulations. So that's what I said in the beginning. When you build these modulations, you have to build these networks very carefully so as to control the weight growth. And this is, remember I said, Yarosky's result when in our generalization. We don't have the width of the network scale with the um, order of the polynomials that you want to approximate because we use a Taylor series and then uh, we use this sawtooth trick. This composition of sawtooth functions gives you piecewise linear functions with a number of linear elements, uh, exponential, uh, to get those approximations uh, that give you optimality. Uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat brittle result because if you don't have all these elements falling into place, you cannot get optimality uh, here. So it's, for this optimality proof, you really need to control all these elements. But uh, again, same story um, as I said before, uh, and you establish optimality of gamma neural network is equal to gamma star of C. So optimality for Wilson basis, I didn't mention here, I mentioned only Gabor is, you use a result by Gröchenig and Samara in 2000, to show optimality for modulation spaces. OK, so here is the list. And so what we can show is that for all these pairs, you see here, with one structure, neural network, you can uh, get optimality. OK, so if they have the learning algorithm, in principle, the neural network can learn the optimal representation uh, for all these function classes. So no prior knowledge on the data structure that you work with uh, needed. All right. What neural networks do is they give you universally optimality of all these function classes. They can even do more. Um, there is uh, 
two functions that we want to look at, or a group of functions and a function. Uh, so we tried to see if we can do something that uh, you know people did not know how to do so far. And so there was the oscillatory textures we looked at, uh, uh, the uh, the optimal dictionaries, uh, no, the best known dictionaries uh, by De Manet and Ying. Uh, these wave atom dictionaries give you low-order polynomial approximation rates. And uh, then we looked uh, at the Weierstrass function, fractal function, and then uh, uh, you exploit Hölder smoothness. Again, you get uh, polynomial approximation rates. So the main result here, so this is how these functions look like. These functions are hard to approximate because you get polynomial approximation rates. And here is the main statement. Deep neural networks give you exponential approximation accuracy for oscillatory textures and for the Weierstrass function. Now, the result on Weierstrass functions was uh, recently extended to more general fractals by Dobigy, DeVore, and Hannon. And uh, if, if you, so if you think about iterated function sets and fractals that are generated by iterated function sets, you can see you compose linear functions with themselves. The identity mapping with a ReLU function you can easily build, so you can kind of see how this can be done with a neural network. So fractals are a very good match, actually, for these composition structures. OK, final result, the case for depths. There is an impossibility result that uh, you can prove, namely, if you have a C3 function and you restrict the width of your network to grow no more than uh, uh, polylogarithmically in 1 over epsilon, and you have a finite depth, then uh, uh, you cannot get the uniform approximation error of epsilon. Okay? Uh, however, with deep neural networks, you can do that. And here is the result. We look at the smooth functions here, then C infinity. The nth derivative is upper bounded in norm by uh, n factorial. The network depth is the polylogarithmic in 1 over epsilon here. Uh, the width is finite, 23. Uh, the uh, coefficient size is bounded by polynomial in 1 over epsilon. That is, in principle, an issue, because if you want to establish rate distortion optimality, that could actually destroy optimality. But you can actually convert uh, the weights uh, uh, to, um, or the network to networks with weights that are upper bounded by a constant at a polylogarithmic depth increase. And so that still gives you polylogarithmic depths. And that's how you get uh, optimality in this case here. OK, if you're interested, uh, uh, in the references, uh, I'll give them in a second, but here's the summary. So deep neural networks can approximate optimally everything classical methods can do, and uh, even more, and all that with one fixed structure, so there's no prior knowledge on the data sets needed. These are the references, and thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So you see how I, I tried to extract myself from the situation that we are in now is uh, A, I said in the beginning, I don't do this. But then I thought this is not enough. So I said Shannon didn't do this when he proved the channel capacity theorem. This was still not enough. Uh, I actually, so now my strategy is going to be to tell you that it's even worse than you point out. Namely, if you ask the question, if I have a given function f of x and I want to map it onto a composition of f and transformations and linearities, is this mapping going to be unique or not? Of course not in general, right? And in fact, there are very few results on that. And uh, probably the most beautiful result, uh, uh, there are some results in control theory. The most beautiful result is by Pfefferman. So if you uh, didn't know his paper on neural networks, he has a paper, Charles Pfefferman, on neural networks and asking this uniqueness question. And uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, this is highly non-unique, OK? So this compounds the problem that, that you point out. You can actually now ask the question, for what nonlinearities can we get close to uniqueness? But there are very simple arguments you can make, like if you have a W matrix, 
that realizes your function, then you can replace it by another W matrix with two uh, rows identical and you will still get the same and so on. So th there is actually um, a canonicity condition and, and then you can construct nonlinearities that give you uniqueness modulo that class here, but those nonlinearities are very complicated functions. They can, however, approximate any decent nonlinearity arbitrarily well. Uh, but before we talk about training, I think we should talk about this uniqueness question. But I fully agree with you. I have nothing, I mean, I have no weapons here. I mean, this is, uh, this is the big problem. Yes. Training or uniqueness? Because for training, uh, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right, and then you have these uh, equivalence classes uh, when you ask the uniqueness question, and if the algorithm finds an element in the equivalence class, the question is which of those elements within the equivalence class is going to generalize well? That's yet another difficult question, right? Sorry, but you had another comment. Uh, Yes. So, in a, in a way, do we have any interpretation of these results in terms of high dimensionality? Right. So, uh, uh, of course, you are uh, outlining all the big open questions. Uh, the, so, what the way I like to think about this is, or what I would like to understand, is the following. We have uh, certain structures, like functions on manifolds. Um, or unions of subspaces in compressed sensing and so on. So there is um, a very beautiful theory, a geometric measure theory, that allows you to describe all these structures that we use in sparse signal processing and beyond, uh, you know, in, 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 in one framework, essentially. So what I would like to understand is that uh, fundamentally, if you have signals that live on those objects, let's not talk about manifolds only, can deep neural networks universally, uh, optimally represent functions in, in high dimensions on those different structures. And uh, I have no clue whatsoever, but I'm just throwing something out. I would really want this to be true, and uh, we're trying it. Um, yes. Yes. So we replace the basis concept yes. by the concept of neural network. Right. And the bare batches now is that that is one structure. Done in principle, the, the finding of the neural network is uh, done by optimization. Exactly. Well, basically one structure. Right. Yeah. The neural network is another structure. Yes. Right? So. No, the, the, the thing I, I tried to say it twice, but probably was not clear enough, is that if you know something about your data, let's say, well, it's never going to live in a base of space and relation space, but this kind of structure you have, then you would choose the corresponding dictionary, right? So you need to have some knowledge of your data. What I'm saying here is that forget about that. You don't need it. Just give me your data. Give me the optimal learning algorithm that I don't know what it is, and the net network is going to find it, right? Or in other words, that's the advance, yeah. So in other words, what I'm saying is that uh, by using a deep neural network structure, there's no fundamental roadblock to representing all those function classes optimally, provided you have this optimal learning algorithm, which we don't know uh, how it looks like. All right. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you.